at that point, we saw playing live as quite old fashioned really, and a little bit, a little bit just like rock and roll. And, and really we wanted to be more modern. We wanted yeah. to be ahead of the game. And MTV had just started around that time, 80, 81, and people were making videos. And we saw that as a much m more interesting, yeah. artistic way to waste your money. Because you could control money. the way it came out, essentially. Yeah. And we just saw the whole... And reach more people, in a way. That's what we figured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've only thought about this recently, but I honestly think that part of it was also... The mystique thing is easier when you're not always in the public eye all the time and you're not easily accessible. The opposite is true for us now. It obviously works brilliantly in our favour that we do make ourselves available in the flesh to people. But if you look back on it, it was like that, that arm's length distance from, from your fans and, and actually having painted representations of you on the sleeves was more of a kind of, you can have... It, you know, it's creating a mystique, essentially. Yeah. And, and I think that was a large part of why... I mean, we, we kept we kept we toying with the idea, didn't we, of live? I remember having meetings with Bob Last and, and we'd talk about stage sets and how it was going to look and what do we were going to do. I don't remember that. Yeah, I do. I, even, I think I've probably even got drawings of... It was what a kind we, of rooftop. We it was a bit like West Side Story. <gasps> Let's do it. It was... <laughs> see, I tell you, you've got no memory. No memory. <laughs> um... I've got little drawings that I did of like a rooftop and chimneys, and so we had meetings late that into more like the night. Mary Poppins. <coughs> no, it's West Side Story. That's where we're basing it, with like you know those yeah. New York. Oh right, yeah, the, the stairways. Stairways, yeah. and that kind of thing. Uh, but then we'd, we and we'd go t quite far down these routes and like start planning it out, and then you then we just go, yeah, but it's still just kind of. A bit old fashioned, isn't it? Really, you know, it's just a bit, it's been done so many times. Shouldn't we try and think of another way to do it? Also, you know, the thing was at the time, and it's still true to a certain extent, is like we various of our contemporaries, like say Simple Minds, for instance, uh, were quite similar to us in the first instance. We were very kind of studio based and we'd done a few, you know, medium sized gigs and whatever, but then they were encouraged to go down that stadium rock route. And we didn't want to turn into a stadium rock band. It just didn't interest us. We didn't also we didn't want to be away from home for like you know six months or a year at a time. It's not. We didn't want to be the Rolling Stones. That's how we saw it. It's no, yeah. no ambition to. I do mean, that. I'm not saying that we were completely right throughout because we do play live now, and and maybe we would have, maybe things would have been very different had we played live. I mean, we certainly turned down a really yeah. large amount of money to not play America and. People were quite amazed that we'd actually done that, and maybe we shouldn't. Have we were done offered that. A, mil a million dollars up front to play. I think it was five gigs in California at our peak, and we just said no. But this goes under, uh, gets filed under stupid, uh, <laughs> stupid things we've done in our career. I, I once turned down a, Re a Rod Stewart album because I didn't like his politics, uh, and uh, I turned down a Bette Midler album because I. I said, oh, she's too old, she's finished. And then she went on to have, like, five Grammys. So we do not... <laughs> there are uh, things that we've missed uh, yeah. that have slipped under the sofa. Yeah, yeah, slightly. No, um, I think that because Luxury Gap had been such an enormous success internationally, I'm looking, I mean, all with the benefit of hindsight now, but I think we both, we all thought, that we may never get a better chance to create what we wanted to to be a kind of masterwork, I suppose you'd call it. Whereas, you know, like Luxury Gap was really good, but it was more about going for the pop jugular, shall we, pop rock jugular. Whereas something with a you know more conceptual depth and conceptual depth and a bit more uh, daring sonically and a bit more daring conceptually yeah uh, you know i want I, I mean use the example of things like um you know, you know sergeant peppers or something but it's not that it it, it it was our version of something similar um and so i i'm only speaking for myself here how men are is my favorite um hem 17 album i think it's the most underrated one we've done personally 
I mean, a lot of people do like it. We know that because we play live now. We have a lot of contacts on social media. And, a, and there is a large amount of people that really want us to kind of go and tour that album. But we haven't done it yet. Whether we will, I don't know. Um, I'd like to. It's just a matter of whether anybody wants, you know, the promoters. <laughs> yeah, it's about promoters wanting to do it or not. But we do, we do play songs from that album yeah. live. So, we, we do, you know, they're kind of getting... What they are. I think there was a bit of kind of, you talk, asked about influencers. I think that for me as well, there's a bit of talking heads in there and bands like that. Yeah. Uh, in the album. Um, I think a lot, I mean, we were starting to absorb <coughs> things like hip hop influencers a little yeah, bit. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot, uh, we used the Fairlight a lot on that album. So that was, and a lot of, re, uh, and a lot of, became very interested in this combination of all, you know, orchestra and programming and what's electronic and what isn't. And the, I've always thought that the magic happens where you can't tell the source origination of the sounds involved. Yeah. That's, that gives you a slight freeze on you. It's kind of like keeps you on the, uh, it keeps you off balance. You and know? even kind of, I remember even vocally, we would, we'd kind of do, what is it, five minutes before midnight? Is yeah. It, that track. You, we'd kind of we'd been out and nicked these massive bits of corrugated iron and we'd made our own vocal booth out of <laughs> corrugated iron and we'd, so it was kind of really live and metally sounding. And also I was jumping up and down and running so before we did the vocal and then, so I'm kind of really genuinely kind of out of breath and saying, okay, go, go and run around again because you've kind of got <laughs> your breath back. So we were just kind of messing around and just experimenting. We with. were experimenting with a lot of uh, recording techniques. I mean, like one of the tracks for it, well, like, and that's no lie. Uh, we had uh, mm. tape loops going around the entire <clears throat> studio uh, for like the core. We spent like three days recording the, the, the choral loop that's on the front of that, yeah. didn't we? Yeah, and it's just and we, and it's we, people holding pencils yeah. with quarter-inch tape going and in a bigger room than this and in corners and going out so they could go... Oh, mm, yeah, oh, oh, and we'd slow it down, you know, the flanging techniques and all that stuff. And then we were also, when we were mixing, we were running three 24-track tape machines at the same time, which took 15 seconds every time you had to, to get them into sync, every time you started them. And it was like... You know, like that that track, for instance, uh, and, and that and that's no lie. Probably took five days to mix. You know, these things are inconceivable now. I mean, yeah, you, it, you, it was just madness. I mean, we were definitely pushing the capabilities of yeah. what could be done in the studio. You know, these days it's easy with your computer; you can do anything like that. But we were really kind of at the edge of what we could do. In fact, they even had to hire um, air conditioning. Air Extra conditioning, air conditioning. Units into the studio because we got so much gear that it was because it was kind of failing because it was too hot. Yeah, it's true. Actually, <clears throat> it was insane. We had mountains of hired gear, some fantastic classic kind of valve compressors, and I mean yeah, this is all geek stuff. But the point is that it was like we were determined to make the best sounding album as well as the content. You know, is the most important thing. And I have to say, when we played back. How men are in the studio at um, Air Studios in Oxford Street. When we first played that back, and it was the fir one of the first albums that was mastered onto a digital format, wasn't it? Yeah. I think the digital half-inch tape or quarter-inch tape, and you know, in between the tracks, normally you'd hear a tiny when it's played live. Yeah. Loud, you'd hear a bit of tape hiss and stuff. It's total si digital silence, right? <laughs> and I remember listening to this album. And actually, there was tears in my eyes at the end of it. I thought, that is literally as good a thing as we can make at this point. I don't think we could have made this sound any better than it sounds now. And I don't think I've ever felt that about any production I've done for anybody else or anything. Because normally, at the end of a uh, recording and production and mixing process, you, you've, you're so fed up with listening to the bloody thing that you don't want to hear it for a while. But this is just like a piece of crystalline beauty. And I still think it sounds incredible when played through the right system, of course. In, in a way, they were getting more human by that time because uh, when we first started, like Penthouse and Pavement, it really was tapping numbers in. There weren't, you know, we, we, it wasn't even a computer screen. We were kind of putting numbers into yeah, sequences. 
and then the then you got the you know the Lindrum, so yeah. you start programming. But by the time the Fairlight came back, it kind of it, I know it wasn't; it was still a computer, mm. but it kind of felt a little more interactive, and it felt a little more like you were you were in control, and you could see what was happening because it had the screen and things. So <clears throat> what it was was um, we used this thing called an MC eight, I think it was a Roland MC eight. It was like hardware sequencer, and that literally was typing in numbers. Um, it didn't have a graphic display, it was just numbers, LED numbers. And um, what the, the methodology for us was when, the, w instead of writing conventional demos, i.e. an average band would sit in a rehearsal room and write something like the rough structure, that, and we go, oh, that, that, and that sounds great when we're jamming and all that. Our version of that was doing the really fine detail, basic construction programming on something like this hardware sequencer and the fair light. But then, what tended to happen, and the way that we liked it, then we'd add the live instruments afterwards and the vocals and everything, and not really go back to the program bit afterwards. So that would be used as the bedrock, which gave it a, a very deep level. It was very technological, which gave us the freedom to be quite organic over the top of it. Yeah. That's well put, wasn't it? Oh, I should put them in my lectures. Yeah, so here's the thing. So, you know, like when you're kind of on this on this voyage of discovery and s some success and some non-success, and you're constantly trying to uh, adjust the tiller to to go right. What did we do wrong? What can we improve on from the last album? Or just what can we change or what to can make we it more change? interesting? Yeah, and so what one direction that we've not really gone down. We'd just done our first ever, I think I'm right in saying, our first ever live gig on the tube. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we were playing with some session players and we were enjoying this idea of having a band. It's a, it's a bit like Bowie doing, you know, that band thing that he did uh, later on. Um, what was it called? <laughs> Tin Machine. Tin Machine, yeah. Um, that turned out well. And... Uh, so we got this band of musicians together and we were looking at... Uh, uh, and going, would it be nice to not to have the responsibility all the time of doing programming and stuff? Maybe actually just letting it breathe a bit more with a, with a more organic sound. Hence you got things like contenders. They're all written. They're all written on samplers now we're in. Remember, like uh, we had um, the Roland 700 by that time. I think, yeah, probably. that's right, yeah. Um, and so we were starting to get into sampling technology and... The idea of creating stuff from, you know, basically cutting up pieces of other people's records and mutating them and it was really hip hop philosophy. We started doing that, but we wanted a live band over the top. So it's always this thing about an organic versus the electronic, not versus, the, that tension between the two. My view on it now, looking back on Pleasure One, is we went too far in that direction. But it's easy to be wise after the fact. Isn't it? Also, we had Brian Tench producing it, right? Yeah. And his sound was very kind of rock and middly, wouldn't it? Sound. He did uh, the Bee Gees song. Um, what? I don't know. I don't know. You win again. You win again. <laughs> he did. He produced that. He just produced that, and it was all that big <coughs> clunky kind of drums and you know we thought and he's a mate of ours right yeah so he produced that album and um it was partially successful because by this time we thought we were great songwriters we weren't quite as great as we thought we were but who is but who is <laughs> yeah and but there are some great nevertheless some great songs on that album I just think it's it was a time when we'd moved Ian had moved to Twickenham, hadn't he? And yeah. and we'd decided to build us instead of then paying studio fees massive, we'd decided to build our studio. He'd got a big house in Twickenham and so we decided to build our studio there. So we spent some time doing that. And you just kinda of just do lose focus, don't yeah. you? You just kinda of lose the, the focus and it, it just also, the context changes, you know, and by this time, funnily enough, I just did a, 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 a long, detailed interview about 
1986, 1986, you know, 1985, 6, 7. And the context was changing into much more record companies wanted uh, to control the creative process. So they were, they were dictating what, uh, they, it was much more like they were taking the lead from retail. Retail was saying, we want, you know, they, we need more up-tempo, we need more ballads, we need, you know, and, and, or else we're not going to stock it in Woolworths or, or you know. And, and suddenly the tail was wagging the dog, so this fed back into the creative zeitgeist in a lot of record companies. They started employing marketing managers who became almost, almost like A&R people. So we were very aware that we were no longer young, funky, new kids on the block that we had to start appealing to a broader audience. And that is when you start chasing your tail, I think, for a lot of artists. Because we couldn't really be anybody... The other thing, ah, here's another thing as well, which I spotted the other day. A very strong vocal identity, like Glenn, or say, you know, Martin Fry, or, you know, was a very, was almost a prerequisite of being successful in the early 80s. By the mid 80s, we were moving into, uh, it almost became a liability to have something so identifiable. It was not about the star voice anymore, it was about the sound of the record and the marketability of this can of beans. And that went on into the, the whole 90s thing with the dance uh, thing, and where the voice suddenly becomes like a, almost like another instrument in the mix. But we're back around the other side now. I think a distinctive voice has given us longevity. Yeah. I just it's true, isn't it? We haven't <laughs> tried disguising it at certain points. Uh, certainly later in the 90s. Yeah, you know? yeah. We just, we just kind of... I think it just comes down to the fact that you suddenly kind of... You get fuzzy around the edges. You kind of lose focus. You're looking for something exciting still to do. It might not be what you've been doing. It might be something else. For you, you got it with your production yeah, work yeah. and other people. Yeah. Um, so I, we just kind of stopped working. We didn't actually split up. No. We never no. split up, but we just said, okay, let's just take a break. Let's not even think about any more M17 stuff. Uh, and we were still going out and yeah, yeah. seeing each other yeah. socially, and but we just yeah. didn't work as M17 for... Oh, we did get dropped, though, remember? <laughs> yeah, that helped. <laughs> When we did, try, we did, we did actually um, uh, look to continue Hem Seventeen when it was when we were dropped by Virgin. Uh, we did some uh, demos for ZTT, didn't we? For instance, we did actually. Yeah, yeah. There's a track called Baby Giant. Somewhere, Baby Giant. It? There's one called The Age of Disgrace. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of it just it just didn't seem it never focused. Got, it wasn't focused enough and no. and interesting enough. No, we've never been sick of each other, no. We argue a lot in the studio, and we kind of shout at each other in the studio, and Martin hates me. No, no, no. You do, you hate me, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I never you hate you. You're a very though. sensitive soul. No, I'm not sensitive, you just hate me. <laughs> no, no, we don't, but we've... It's, we always leave it in the studio. It's not even a conscious thing. We don't even know we're going to leave it in the studio, but mm. literally we will go to the studio and go, fancy a pint, yeah. and, we go, and then it's completely yeah. gone and normal, and we've... We've been close friends since we were, you know, I think... 40 years, isn't Yeah, it? for 40 years, and there's, there's never yeah. been any... Um, Fallout. No. Fallout or anything. We just... There's always... And we always do interesting things together, even if it's not M17, we've still done other things. And yeah. I mean, the, the, we, we do... Um, the, the, there was a point where you formed another band, right? Yeah, Ugly. I did a band called Ugly, yeah. Um, and at that time I was doing lo lo loads of other production and stuff and then there's always the BEF thing which came a bit later on, vo Volume 2, which Glenn was on. You know, it's, it's an ongoing story, it's a, it's a long-term nar narrative which dips in and out of. Hem 17 is, is a continual theme which dips in and out. Obviously we, Ian's not sitting in here between us. And, he is, um, he is, can you not see him? Yeah, he's on my shoulder, yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, he, he kind of slowly, at that point, at that time as well that we stopped working Ian just kind of stopped being involved as much really didn't he and then he just kind of yeah fade, faded out well no we did uh, the, the we did bigger than America didn't yeah no I mean after that when after, after that yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah after bigger than America Ian just kind of went and just kind of had enough I 
think he's back in Sheffield. He was at university. I think he was doing Neuros. neuroscience at university uh, in Sussex, I think. Yeah. And and I think he's now back in Sheffield. Um, and he was didn't was it, didn't be lecturing in Liverpool, didn't Jed? Somebody said I don't know. No idea. But we really just have had honestly no contact. But we still there. I have absolutely no regrets. I think it was a really interesting journey, that whole Virgin era from start to... Virgin era yeah. was interesting from start to finish. They had some amazing people working at Virgin. Yeah. Um, we couldn't have done it without Virgin, that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, they were incredibly supportive. They were almost like part of the team, which I think is the most <coughs> effective way that you can work with a young artist, is to give them the confidence to express themselves. It's a very, very, very rare thing nowadays. Yeah, um, I mean, they were instrumental in, you know, even the even the BEF uh, albums, you know, in yeah. helping finding yeah. artists and yeah. suggesting artists. Yeah. It was a really good relationship with Virgin. In fact, we would go in there quite often on a because we lived they, they were on Labrook Grove and we lived just off Labrook Grove and Oxford Gardens. And we'd just go in there on a Friday afternoon and end up going to the pub and spending the night with them. And it, it was it's a family, really, wasn't it? Spending Friends the night. and family. Exactly. Probably not the right. The evening, sorry. <laughs> spending the evening. <laughs> spending the evening with it. I never and, slept and, with and, uh, Virgin. No, no, no. And uh, Richard Branson, who would never have any money. He'd always get his secretary to pay. But um, literally, we, would, we managed ourselves at that point. We just had a, a, an accountant and a lawyer. Uh, so... We've always believed in, not just from a business point of view, but, but people need to feel an emotional investment in what you're doing. Everybody wants to make money, that's fair enough, but they have to feel like, they, everybody's got to feel valued in the process. And Virgin were very, very good at, uh, at doing that, and they liked us for that reason. In fact, we were the first peop people they called. <clears throat> when Virgin were having their 40th anniversary celebrations we was the first people they called we i think they had a soft spot for us all the people from that time <laughs>